now the laboratory on top of the graveyard applied to the post-World War I peace settlements, in particular the political aspects of post-World War, World War I Europe, the borders, minority rights, and so forth. The notion of innovation and haunting destruction is also obvious in cultural life. Many of the artists, some of whom we've already discussed, were really at their peak of creativity during these years. Art, literature, feel free to point. Art, literature, uh, music, architecture was just absolutely booming. And among the leaders were Kafka, Yeats, Joyce, the German writer Thomas Mann, Virginia Woolf, Clay, and Picasso. Merriman text includes more details on culture, if you're interested in any of these artists, and we'll explore that further. But together with its creative expression, there was also a theme of alienation and loss, anxiety and despair. Themes that we're sort of familiar with, certainly they were prevalent in Zamyatin's dystopian novel We, which you discussed this week, or will be discussing shortly, and also in the film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, you saw a clip of that on Tuesday. This mixture of alienation and innovation can also be summed up in a 1919 poem by William Butler Yeats, and it's called The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening year, the falcon cannot hear the falcon air. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs <coughs> while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast is our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. The image of a laboratory on a graveyard is useful to show the ways that there was a possibility for real innovation amidst the destruction of the war, but the very destructiveness of the war haunted these efforts in the post-war years. What's significant, though, what I want to emphasize is the peacemaking process was not doomed to failure. It wasn't perfect. Certainly the Treaty of Versailles is one example. But given the situation that the peacemakers had to deal with, these peace treaties and the, the, the border issues and the issues of minority rights, the way they were dealt with wasn't really the worst case scenario. What was particularly crucial, however, was how, or the spirit, I suppose, in which populations, but especially leaders, rejected or accepted these treaties and settlements and tried to work with them. You saw the example of Turkey and Germany, who both had different responses to the peacemaking process. Last week, we covered the Russian Revolution and the Civil War. So today, we're going to pick up where we left off with the Soviet system, and we're going to look at particular how the Soviet system developed under Stalin, how it was strengthened, and how we ruled it. Even though Stalin and Lenin and the Soviet state emerged victorious from the Civil War, by 1921, Russia was absolutely in tatters. If you remember, Lenin had mobilized his nation for war through a combination of ideological commitment, in part
art through the use of tear with the Cheka, and also by introducing a sense of pragmatism, so practical decision-making policies. A particular policy was known as war communism, and this, according to this policy, the government had nationalized large aspects of Russian infrastructure, so transportation, communication facilities, uh, banks, mines, and factories, as well as businesses that implied or employed more than 10 workers. In the name of the revolution, the state had assumed the right to requisition the food of peasants, who often, of course, resisted fiercely, though with little success. As a result, hunger in the countryside became widespread and led to starvation. To make matters worse, there was a famine, or a drought, between 1920 and 1922 that led to a famine. And all in all, estimates are that this period, the, the famine uh, claimed about 5 million lives throughout the Russian Empire. To make matters worse still, this agricultural disaster in Russia was paralleled by industrial collapse. By 1921, industrial production was actually only 20%, only 20% of what it had been prior to World War I. So basically, Russia was absolutely exhausted. And reflecting on this difficult period, Leon Trotsky said, the collapse of the productive forces surpassed anything of the kind that history had ever seen. The country and the government with it were at the very edge of the abyss. So these disastrous economic conditions in Russia led to massive peasant rebellions and also to workers' protests. How did the communists pull Russia back from the abyss? Well, they decided to implement, for the sake of recovery, they adopted what was referred to as a temporary retreat. This was a retreat away from hardcore communist principles. In other words, they would put their goals to sort of nationalize and revolutionize all of industry, to collectivize all the agriculture, and to extend state control over the entire economy, they were going to put these goals on hold. In their place, Lenin established what he referred to as the new economic policy. So this is a very important part of the temporary retreat. It was also referred to as NEP, and it was instigated on March 21st, 1921. NEP would allow small-scale industries to be privately controlled. It would also allow peasants to trade their products on the market for their own private, um, for their own private uh, uh, wealth or building of wealth. At the same time, however, large industries and major economic institutions were going to remain in government hands. So this as well was a strategy based on pragmatism. It was something that didn't always come easy to communist hardliners. But in the early days, the Bolsheviks understood that they needed a healthy peasantry to provide food for workers in the cities. And they needed peasant grain, basically, to subsidize the development of the new industry. Already. By 1922, things were starting to look up for Russia. Lenin and the communists created, formally created, the new state, which was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, commonly known, of course, as the Soviet Union. In that year as well, the revived market created by the new economic policy and a good harvest brought the famine to an end and agricultural output actually now stood at 70% of its pre-war level, so up from 20 to 70%. On the other hand, industry, and especially state-owned heavy, heavy industry, 
didn't go as well, and in fact started to stagnate, or continued to stagnate. Overall though, NEP had saved the Soviet Union from a complete economic disaster. Even though Lenin and the other leaders intended this only as a temporary tactical retreat from their goals. So you can think about the new economic policy as the way Lenin tried to salvage the economy by, by a form of compromise. At the same time, as the communists struggled to get the economy back on track, they also worked to strengthen their own one-party state. As a result, government bureaucrats, the number of government bureaucrats increased dramatically, and so, in fact, soon constituted, constituted what would be termed a new elite. They had the best jobs, the best apartments, access to the best food, which is not really a communist principle. And this irony wasn't lost on, on Lenin, who started to issue warnings about the widening power of the bureaucracy that he had helped to create. And we'll see violent repercussions to this widening <coughs> bureaucracy in the Stalinist years. <coughs> Along with NEP, there were also other kinds of compromises that the Soviets made to consolidate power and they ended up having quite a long-term um, significance. One of the important ones you might be surprised to hear was in the area of gender relations. Marxism, of course, held that equal inequalities of sex or religion or race or ethnicity were not uh, sort of um, genuine divisions in society. Rather, they were symptoms of bourgeois manipulation. They were an artificial division that served the purposes of the ruling class. And they, these, these divisions would cease to have importance after a successful revolution. What really mattered was material reality, who controlled the means of production. Perhaps not surprisingly, Many people who were in sort of a, what you could term a weaker position under the old system expected that their interests after the revolution would change, that their, their, their interests would be taken into account. Among those were women who had been active in the women's movement and also active in the revolution. Lenin promised that the revolution would bring absolute equality between the sexes and religious minorities, and that sexism in general would fade away with the successful revolution. He actually boasted that no state had done as much as for women as Lenin had done. Women had played an important role in the revolution. They had fought in World War I, and they fought in the Civil War as well. We know that their protests had, re had weakened the czarist regime, if you recall the bread riots. And of course, Lenin required their productive capacity during the revolution, during the civil war, and afterwards as well. Some women at least hoped that the revolution would bring about this promised transformation in gender relations. So that it wouldn't just be a political transformation, it would be an entire revolution. One of these key figures was called Alexandra Kolontai. She was a writer, a feminist, publicist, and a revolutionary. And she, she did share the goals of the Bolshevik Revolution. For instance, the abolishment of private property, the establishment of a workers' state. But see, she also envisioned and, and sort of worked for a revolution in gender relations. And indeed, in the first days of the new government, some important measures in this respect were, in fact, passed. Marriage was transformed from a religious act into a civil act. 
divorce was read readily available to either a man or a woman. Abortion was legalized. All Russian adults were required to now work outside of the home, which actually didn't turn out to be that liberating for women. But the idea of putting women officially into the workforce was very important to the success of the revolution. The state also took measures to make the lives of mothers easier. There was prenatal care, and there were daycares established. These things were, according to Lenin, to take the drudgery of housework and, and child care and sort of lift it away from women. However, Kolontai and others hoped that there would be an even deeper transformation and that even the notion of family itself and, and, and the notion of marriage would be revolutionized. That there would be a sort of complete equality between the sexes and within a marriage. She even hoped for sexual freedom, more sexual freedom for women. But her ideas were too shocking for many, and this Soviet leadership itself fought. Lenin actually mocked her, and he said, quote, who wants to drink from a soiled glass? So she was actually sidelined, despite um, the, I guess, powerful and important force that she was during the revolution. Soviet leaders declared that the feminist movement was actually a bourgeois invention and denied that any form of inequality was possible in a Soviet state. However, the Russian Revolution did transform society in many ways, but it also returned to sort of the, the familiar gender relations. Men were to be the master of the household. Women now worked outside of the house, but this didn't make it less liberating. Instead, it was just an added burden. So Lenin had sort of said that, that uh, the drudgery of housework would be removed from women's shoulders, but it didn't disappear. Instead, women were just simply told that their problems were solved. So despite some changes and some advances, much in terms of gender relations was just lip service. Now just as Lenin was solidifying both the Soviet rule and trying to iron out any glitches, his health began to deteriorate. And between 1922 and 1924, he suffered a series of strokes. And he actually died in January of 1924. During this time period, he increasingly gave important decision-making <coughs> powers to Stalin. Who was Stalin? We know the myth, but who was the man behind this myth? Stalin was born in the Georgian region of the Russian Empire in 1879. His father was a shoemaker, an abusive shoemaker, and his mother was very, very religious as was Mussolini. And Stalin, in fact, entered a seminary in Georgia, but he soon rebelled against <coughs> religious authorities. By 1898, he joined the revolutionary movement in Russia, and he became a member of the Bolshevik Party in 1903. He came to Lenin's attention, actually, um, after he had robbed a bank to raise funds for the Bolshevik. Stalin was both ruthless and ambitious. And something perhaps that was made evident when he actually did change his name to Stalin, uh, which was Russian for steel. By 1912, he'd actually become a member of the party's central committee. And he soon took up important roles during the revolution and the civil war. <coughs> Following the revolution, Lenin appointed Stalin as the general secretary of the party. And this is an interesting position because it's a position that many viewed as a boring, bureaucratic job with little glory, little significance to it. But this actually suited Stalin. 
he wasn't a dynamic speaker, or a dynamic writer, or even a dynamic thinker. What would become very clear, however, was that Stalin was an absolutely brilliant organizer. And uh, his colleagues actually called him Comrade Card Index. So very, very quickly, Stalin proved that his position was actually far more important than other Bolshevik leaders had sort of imagined. Uh, for instance, the general secretary of the party was the one who appointed all of the other regional, district, city, and even town um, secretaries. This is useful for, for Stalin because he's a good organizer. With a lust for power, this position is perfect. By 1922, for example, he'd actually appointed upward of 10,000 appointments. And he filled important positions with those who were loyal to him. So with uh, those who are sort of his most trusted followers. This is an aspect that proved absolutely crucial in the struggle for power between um, Trotsky and Stalin and Bukharin, other party leaders, after Lenin's death. So gradually, Stalin, Stalin used his post as party secretary, general secretary, to sort of gain complete control of the Communist Party as a whole. And he did this inch by inch. It actually took Stalin about five years to consolidate his position of power, so from 1924 to 1929, and to establish himself as the dominant personality and force, um, sort of the, the, the vision that we have of Stalin. Also, by 1929, he succeeded in eliminating um, competition. He eliminated uh, Trotsky and other old Bolsheviks from the center of power. So he established an incredibly, incredibly powerful dictatorship that made the, the systems or the regimes of the czars almost pale in comparison. Trotsky, on the other hand, was forced to flee Russia, uh, which he did. He was expelled from the party in 1927. And he became a very harsh critic of Stalin and was forced to flee. He ended up in Mexico, where he was murdered in 1940, likely on the, uh, on the orders of Stalin himself. So after making concessions to stabilize the economy and society and his own position, by the late 1920s, Stalin was able to embark on what is sometimes referred to as the Second Revolution. And this consisted on turning his back on some of the compromises uh, that, the, that were made under the new economic policy. And he pushed forward a, a much more aggressive communist agenda. So beginning in 1928, Stalin embarked on a program of aggressive, aggressive industrialization and agricultural transformation. This was called the first of the five-year plans. And his idea was that the US, the Soviet Union, had to catch up to the West. And the goal was nothing less than the complete transformation of the Soviet Union from an agricultural state to an industrial powerhouse. And Stalin wanted to accomplish this virtually overnight. In his theory, Russia had lost, continually lost wars to the Poles, the British, the French, the Japanese, for the basic reason that Russia was, was in, in Stalin's words, more backward. He said, we are 50 to 100 years behind advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or we shall go under. So the targets that Stalin set for the first five-year plan actually bordered on the absurd. Uh, 